Hello, everyone. Happy Thursday. Thank you for joining us for our very first panel discussion. My name is Colin O'Brien, and I am on the marketing team for Rubik, and I will be your host today. Now, we have a wonderful discussion lined up with a number of our different partners. Um, and before we introduce our panelists today, I'd like to remind our viewers of our NFT giveaway. If you listen to this panel for over 30 minutes, follow us on Discord as well as on Twitter, you will be eligible to receive a custom NFT from Rubik. Now, if you want to view the details of that, you can always go to our Medium or check out our Twitter. We have it posted there, all the official rules and details pertaining to that NFT giveaway. Now, our discussion today revolves around the future of CrossChain. So we'll begin by introducing our panel give our listeners better context to your answers for our questions today, I will call on you to introduce yourself, your project, what your project's working on, um, what, what you guys are currently doing, and what role and what duties you have at your project. And then after we introduce everyone, If you have a differing opinion from any of the other panelists today, I absolutely want to, to have you share your thoughts on that with, with us and all our listeners. So without further ado, let's begin our intros. Please welcome our first guest from Change Finance, Dejun Kian. Hello, everyone. This is Peter. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you just great. Hey, um, yes, I'm from Change. Uh, previously, I have started a couple of different projects, including uh, Qtum, VChain, AnySwast. Uh, today, it is called MultiChain, a feature public blockchain. And now I'm in Change. Change is, a, um, is providing two types of different services. One is the proxy roaming, uh, which enables users to um, move their any assets from one chain to another, just like the crossing bridge, but we use the different terminology. We call it crossing roaming because we don't want the users to care on which chain their assets are on. Uh, and the second service we are providing is the cross-chain liquidity aggregation. So uh, the topic for today is the future of the cross-chain. So that's one of the key um, topics I want to bring up. Um, I think in the future, um, it's not. Uh, it's not like today. Uh, we have liquidity on different DAX in different DAX on different chains, but we have the capability to aggregate the liquidity from all the DAX on all the chains simultaneously. And when users they want to swap, we can help them to split their transaction into fractions and execute on different chains simultaneously. So this is what we're doing. Thank you. So. Absolutely, and thank you for joining us. Um, next, we have uh, Sarang from Sushi Swap. Hey, everyone. I hope you guys can hear me. Yep, we can hear you just oh, great. Awesome. awesome. Yeah, so first of all, happy merge day to everyone. Uh, we had like a great merge, so congrats, everyone, on that. And yeah, uh, I basically uh, work at the solitary side in the Sushi Swap, uh, taking care of you know all our smart contracts. And Sushi, as you guys know, is already basically one of the most popular multi-chain DEXs out there. We have probably rolled out in uh, 17 plus chains. I think probably it's going to be more now. Uh, I don't exactly remember how many chains, but I think it's more than 17 for sure. Uh, and we have always have an outlook of, you know, having like connection between different chains and, you know, the entire multi-chain narrative. And recently we actually launched uh, a cross-chain swaps. I think that was around uh, one or two months ago. And we have got a really good traction from that. So cross-chain swap basically enables you to uh, swap between uh, different assets uh, on different chains in just a single transaction. Uh, we basically use different bridges under the hood. Uh, the going, uh, you know, like the, the vision going forward for Sushi is very, very multi-chain. Uh, and cross-chain, we are not just limited to bridges, but we are also looking at cross-chain communication natively building inside the app. One of our newer updates coming this month would be the multi-chain first UI narrative. So like in Web2, we had like mobile first, uh, which got really popular and which basically made experience really good for the end user. In the same manner, we're gonna launch a multi-chain UI, which would basically show all the positions and opportunities inside SushiSwap all in one single chain. 
uh, all in one single UI. So you don't have to, you know, uh, pop up the ugly pop up of MetaMask and change your chains. And moreover, you could also directly, you know, like uh, do cross chain LPing, cross chain lending, and obviously cross chain swaps, which we already have right now. So it's going to be like, you know, the users even don't have to leave Sushi at all. Everything, every chain, and every opportunity they can just access from one UI. So this is how much we are committed to uh, embracing cross chain, and we definitely think it's it's future and it's gonna happen for sure. Excellent. Well, thank you for joining us today, Sarang. I appreciate it. Um, next, we have Steve Yu coming from Seller. Hi, folks. Uh, this is Steve from Seller's BD team. Um, you guys probably know. Uh, that seller's been around uh, for a few years since 2018. Uh, we're very focused on blockchain interoperability. Uh, that's our bread and butter, um, probably best known within the space for our bridge, uh, C Bridge, where we're enabling uh, the bridging of fungibles to NFTs and general message passing. So we're heavily focused on the general message passing, and currently we have about 30 projects that have either launched or in the process of launching with us to support their various use cases from uh, interchain uh, borrowing to lending to DEX is taking advantage of it. So I'm sure we'll be diving more into that. And currently, <clears throat> Seabridge is supporting 35 plus chains, and we're adding about three new chains on a, on average on, on a monthly basis. And uh, we've done over 10.6 billion in transaction volume. So uh, yeah, we're fast expanding to support more chains uh, as well as uh, projects. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you, Steve. Appreciate you being here today with us. Thank you. Um, next, we have Alex Smirnov from DeBridge. Hey, guys. Uh, uh, this is Alex from DeBridge. Thanks for having me here today. So, yeah, basically in DeBridge, we are building a secure, secure interoperability layer for Web3 with the global mission to interconnect any smart, smart contracts across different chains and to enable very secure and efficient uh, transportation level for any messages and value across different chains. So yeah, basically we provide the framework um, that can be used to tap into different uh, cross-chain opportunities and to build any secure and decentralized cross-chain applications. That comes to cross-chain compatibility between smart contracts when smart contracts in chain A can do a cross-chain call with a smart contract in chain B. User and protocols can also do the cross-chain swaps between arbitrary liquid assets. And I think the swap, like the solution built on top of the bridge for the first uh, technology and the very first protocol that enables swap between any uh, liquid assets. And uh, yeah, basically generic messaging um, infrastructure can be used in many different ways to bridge any NFTs and make them interoperable across many blockchains, as well as to assemble money laggers in a cross-chain scale and uh, yeah very very excited to provide this infrastructure to web3 community and uh, we are also uh, very development friendly we have the whole set of development tools that comes to sdk hard hat plugin and dswap api that makes it very easy to build secure and efficient uh, cross-chain applications so yeah thanks for inviting me here today Absolutely, Alex, and thank you for joining us. Um, next, we have Nick Avermov from Symbiosis. Um, yes, hi, everyone. Um, can you hear me well? Yes, we can hear you just perfectly. Oh, cool, cool, cool. Uh, thank you for having me today. I see lots of familiar phrases here, like Steve and I and, um, and Rest, actually, and um, glad to see that we are working in, let's say, same domain. Uh, to make our uh, to approach our cross-chain future for not only the end of community but also for the developers and um, good generation of developers. So in a nutshell, also I'm in charge of marketing operations and business development and not code. So I'm pretty useless guy in the team, you know. Um, but apart from joking, what we do, we do a cross-chain liquidity uh, protocol. We are developing this for year, one year and a half. Uh, so our know-how is one click, uh, any to any as it swaps across different chains, both EVM compatible and non-EVM compatible. That's part of the story. And second part of the story that we provide interchain communication, uh, which once again can be called general message pass across different networks so that 
this can be conceived as a liquidity provision to any protocol with any token NFT purchase, regardless this particular NFT collection is uh, minted on a particular network and the user has token to purchase it or not. Like NFT collection minted on Avalanche, and we can provide infrastructure so that users purchase it with BNB or whatever. And so, yeah, that's pretty much what we do. And uh, once again, thank you for having me today. Uh, looking forward to have a fruitful and insightful conversation with all of you today. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Nick, for, for joining us. Um, next, we have Jason Ma from Axelar. Hey, everyone. Thanks for your time today. Um, yeah, so I'm from Axler, and Axler's mission is to create the most secure and seamless cross-street communication infrastructure for Web3 while maintaining our commitment to building truly decentralized structures. You know, so what we've been working on here at Axler is really like two main work streams, right? One, integrating more blockchains, so, you know, major layer ones as well as new app chains, as well as, uh, uh, you know, these on the other side, on the second platform, really integrating as many apps into our ecosystem as possible. So we currently have over 90 applications using Axler's API to build cross, cross chain applications. And, you know, we're really excited about what our technology is bringing to Web3. Excellent. Thank you so much, Jason. Appreciate you being here today with us. Uh, next, we have Dima Brook from XP Network. Yeah, hi guys. Uh, glad to be here. Well, I represent XP Network, a multi-chain NFT bridge. We're probably the biggest NFT bridge in the industry. We connect more than 20 chains. Uh, most, uh, a lot of those are non-EVM, so we deal with multiple protocols, and uh, we support multiple token standards. And we all see that there are uh, many solutions for a fungible token bridging but very few for non-fungible tokens and you guys probably know those who, who of you support non-fungible tokens that it's much uh, more difficult to transfer nfts than fungible tokens because fungible tokens you just have a contract with which is a ledger of how many of those tokens uh, this or that owner has but for nfts you also have to support the contract logic sometimes if it's a game metaverse or something similar or at least you have to support uh, metadata across multiple chains uh, so that the assets are properly displayed and uh, used because not, not all NFTs are just images or videos. Some are used as keys, like access keys or um, even uh, controllers for IoT devices. And uh, I think at the moment we are at the front line of, of this technology. And we also keep building. We keep joining more and more blockchains. Um, like on a monthly basis, we join from five to, well, around five, five new blockchains. It depends on the complexity of the protocol that they're using. And uh, at the moment, we support more than 20. And by the end of the year, we are going to uh, approximate 30 blockchains. Uh, for, for many of the chains that we support, we are the only NFT bridge they have. and Therefore, we re already received 16 grants from different blockchains. We only didn't receive grants from Ethereum, BSC, and Polygon. Most of the other chains that we support, we, we uh, received grants from the chains. So first of all, they trust our technology. And second, before we even receive the uh, uh, grant money, they check that it works. And only then it's released to, to the public. Thank you for having me. It's a real pleasure. Absolutely, Dima, and thank you for joining us today. Um, and last but not least, uh, Vladimir Takamarov. He is the co-founder of Rubik. He'll be joining us again in just a little bit. He's having some technical difficulties right now, so he'll jump in in a little bit and uh, participate in this conversation today. So without further ado, let's dive right into it. So, you know, there are... Uh, you know, Web3, DeFi, right? These are all buzzwords that the general public is now just starting to hear. Um, Cross-chain as a DeFi service. What do you guys see as the prospects of, of cross-chain really affecting decentralized finance? And what kind of impact is that going to have on the industry? Um, let me start today with 
Serang, um, because SushiSwap is one of the largest decentralized exchanges in the industry. Um, would you like to give us your insights? Yeah, uh, I mean, like, we actually wanted to look at some data entire cross-chain narrative, uh, but what we have seen is, like, before with the cross-chain narrative itself, right, things were quite isolated, and it was actually a lot difficult to create cross-chain apps, and it's still actually not very easy because there are a lot of security conditions that you have to take care of. Uh, but going forward, we have seen, like, you know, like different kinds of solutions popping up, like a lot of them you could even see in the panel, which are doing like quite good work. And those are kind of DeFi as a service. So uh, at least from where we are coming, we are at the consumer side where uh, the other people who are building this bridge infrastructure is at the producer side. And we are really actually want to kind of, you know, use and consume as many producers as possible because that gives us good coverage. So we're also looking in different kind of services that could help us do that. So I feel like in the prospect side, it enables our users to basically connect through all the deployments that we have, because at Sushi, we had seen like different fragmentations happening and the fragmentation is still there, but what it's easy is like as a service, you could easily go from one place to another, which, which makes it very intuitive for the user being in the same UI. And the other part is the visibility, right? So if, if let's say you could get a native token on like an Arbitrum from Ethereum, it basically enables more volume. So that's what we have seen that users are actually using it as a service and you don't actually see that you're even using cross-chain for you, it's just a normal thing. So for us, it's kind of, you know, consuming all this uh, DeFi services by the producers or, and, you know, like such as different kinds of bridges and cross-chain machining solutions. Perfect. Thank you for thank you for that input. Um, Dejun, do you have something that you'd like to add to that? Uh, hey, yeah. Um, I think for the future decentralized the finance, the cross chain would be a very key component and a very important infrastructure for us. Um, especially when we see multiple different chains, uh, they emerge. And uh, um, after Avalanche, uh, other layer two uh, blockchains, and uh, recently we hear about SUI uh, and other very well-known new public blockchains. I think one of the most important thing is the connectivity, which means you know those different public blockchains they can interact with each other, and the aggregation can be aggregated to support one business purpose um, and the, the messages they can router to different public blockchains to trigger uh, the different smart contracts. So I think that the connectivity is always the, the major theme uh, starting from the internet age because, you know, internet is about connectivity and the, the, the blockchain and the cryptos, uh, they are also uh, silo in value today, just like the traditional finance. But what we need to do is to connect them together to make sure the value can flow from one chain to another freely in a very short period of time. Uh, you know, today, uh, our crossing um, speed uh, is about uh, one or two minutes. Uh, even if you are trying to cross chain uh, some assets from a non EVM compatible chain uh, to uh, to another uh, public blockchain, or even you want to make the transfer like from multiple different chains into one chain. Uh, the speed is about one to two minutes, so speed is very important. And the second is the uh, uh, the aggregation of the liquidity because the DeFi is everything about the liquidity. <laughs> if we look at the DeFi components today uh, or the DeFi protocols today, uh, we hear about Uniswap, uh, we hear about A Compound, uh, the loan protocols, but the, the essence of all of those DeFi protocols is about liquidity. So I think we need to focus on the liquidity first. Uh, and uh, today, change has aggregated about 70 billion US dollars value of liquidity in one point when users, they want to from token A to token B, we can pull the liquidity from all of those 
uh, liquidity on different chains and different DAX. And then we can serve, uh, serve this type of high premium uh, service uh, and uh, provide the smallest the slipping when users to use. Thank you. Absolutely. Perfect. Um, Steve, I, 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 I hear you'd like to jump in. Now, I want to remind all our panelists, if there is any time uh, you want to jump in and give your thoughts on something, um, please feel free. But you can cut me off as I'm, I'm about to call on somebody. So, <laughs> Thanks for that. I, I think DJ brings up a very valid point there because, you know, Seabridge as an infrastructure provider, as a bridge within the ecosystem, like we have a pretty good pulse of the ecosystem, how it's moving, how it's trending, how it's developing. So we saw a demand for first starting off with asset bridging uh, earlier uh, in 2021, um, you know, and then and then as more projects came in with their multi-chain ambitions to, you know, expand, uh, starting with fungibles, and then we saw a spike in requests for NFTs. And then, but more recently, it's been a lot more about interoperability. Um, so. You know, you know, we see about maybe five percent of the projects, you know, requesting specifically supporting for that, and and we're blown away by sort of some of the creativity as well as the use cases that we're seeing. So, for example, uh, one of the key NFT projects that we're working with at the moment, you know, the integration they're looking at is, you know, allowing their NFT marketplaces to basically, uh, you know, lock up their NFTs on one chain and borrow against that on another chain, like you know, on BNB. Or we're also seeing DEXs that allow users to basically swap across multiple chains from just one chain. Um, and there's a project called ChainHop that we've incubated that's doing that. So the use case from like yield aggregators, uh, we're also seeing where um, they're managing multiple blockchain vaults from a single chain. Um, and so it's sort of like, um, it, it's, it amazes us sort of the, seeing the spectrum of use cases. So that's sort of uh, our view as an infrastructure provider, um, and and I think it's very encouraging. Thanks. Yeah, I, I have jumped in here. So you know, with Axler, we're seeing the exact same thing that Steve is saying. You know, the question is really no longer like, do we want to build cross-chain use cases, cross-chain functionality? It's saying everyone's saying we do, but who should we use, and is this solution secure, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, with Axler, one of the reasons why we're seeing so many projects building on top of us is people really appreciate the fact that we are very decentralized. And I think it also helps that we are IBC compatible and there is a lot of uh, momentum towards the Cosmos ecosystem. But, you know, just like Steve mentioned, with message passing, the ability to now pass instructions as well as an asset, with an asset, this opens a whole new world of possibilities, right? You're able to now build these true cross-chain applications that, you know, can combine multiple functionalities together to massively improve user experience as well. Yeah, and ju just to add really quickly, uh, like all the speakers raised, really great point. But what what I've seen uh, in the interoperability space is that like, the all the use cases are kind of split up into two categories. And like most of the bridging technologies and interoperability protocols are solving two different issues. One is like how to efficiently transfer uh, value or liquidity and how to aggregate liquidity across different chains. And other direction is like how to transfer data and in a seamless crossing calls between our And uh, what, we, what we are focused on in DeepBridge is to enable very secure and efficient transfers of value and messages simultaneously. Because we really think that like cross-chain liquidity transfer is not enough. Because whenever users or protocols are moving liquidity from chain A to chain B, they got to do something with liquidity, like provide liquidity into the protocol or open position at perpetual market, or like that can be any complex cross-chain interaction. And many existing interoperability protocols do not allow to perform like complex transactions. And uh, because like the message that is passed between chains should encode arbitrary set of transaction calls. And uh, this is like one of the areas that we kind of open in DeepBridge to let any protocols to perform any complex logic. Because let's say, my bet is that, that like interoperability is needed for money legos. And money lego is like one of the most powerful concept of DeFi. And we've seen many good money legos that were built within one specific chain like Curve and Convex or Aave and Dart. But so far, 
we have not seen many Legos built on a cross-chain scale. That's why we need to have interoperability layer that allows to transfer liquidity and message simultaneously. And uh, we, we see like, first attempts from teams who are trying to innovate and build like the very first cross-chain applications and cross-chain protocols. And I think that in the very near future, we'll see more and more use cases when, where developers will combine DeFi protocols and a cross-chain scale. Because let's say when we have like um, decentralized uh, stable But if we have in layer that product may choose what perpetual market will get, the, will provide the better funding. And um, this will enable like new capital efficiency. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing like all the cross-chain protocols and applications that we build within the next year, utilizing any of the interoperability layers that we have so far. Excellent. Thank you, Nick. Uh, Dima, do you, either of you have anything to input? I would say that um, so from from what we from what we have heard already, uh, the only thing that I want to also emphasize is that the experience uh, of the end user is the ultimate goal here. Because uh, what taught me, in particular, like the boom of ISO projects and back to 2016, 17, and so on and so forth. Uh, yes, everybody talks about innovation, about cross chain, about multi chain, whatever. The idea is to make the experience when you're working with different DeFi protocols as smooth as working with, I don't know, de food delivery service or uh, right hailing service that we have in the web too. So, the idea is that not to somehow cannibalize the experience uh, on the user experience when fostering innovation. So, that's what in particular we are trying to achieve at Symbiosis while providing communication and so on and so forth. But all that, all those being equal, totally agree with all the speakers, especially with Alex and uh, Jason. Well, our solution, uh, our solution is mainly built about NFTs and SFTs. Uh, we are not building a fungible token bridge, so uh, we are not really about so much DeFi. But basically, without NFTs and SFTs, there is uh, you don't have goods to sell. So basically, fungible tokens is like money in the crypto world, and NFTs and SFTs are the goods that you can buy and sell. And um, it is, um, it's very sad that many people use NFTs and SFTs just as um, tools for speculation, uh, which is not the purpose of those tokens. The purpose is instant uh, registration of ownership or passing ownership from one user to another in a decentralized way. So in a way, what we are building is the market for moving uh, ownership between chains and um, acquiring new user bases um, on different chains and different protocols. So um, I think this, this accompanies everything that all the other good projects that are present here are doing. And this is something that the future of uh, crypto industry cannot live without. So it's great that you can have so many currencies, but then you have to buy some goods for those currencies. And this is what we are concentrating at. Excellent. Thank you, everybody, for your input. You know, I wholeheartedly agree with you all. I think that the, the future of DeFi um, is going to be very complicated to, to build all of this, right? That's... One of the reasons why uh, at Rubik we're we're leveraging all your guys' hard work and kind of um, putting it together in a comprehensive package that is forward facing to users uh, for you know different applications. Um, no one person can hope to build you know everything, um, and and every single one of your projects is is working on some unique aspect of the industry. Um, and we're so proud to be working with all of you guys. You guys are, are doing some excellent work out there. Um, and thank you for your insights on that. Um, let's move on to the next question here. Now, this is with regard to interoperability for dApps, for decentralized applications. Um, what do you guys see as the prominent use cases? Um, and who would you consider to be like major providers of this? Who do you see stepping up? Do you see 
Do you see Web 2 companies moving into Web 3, some big hitters? Do you see it being um, some of these up-and-coming projects uh, for the during this next bull run that, that will really make an impact on the industry? How do you guys see the interoperability for cross-chain affecting decentralized applications? Yeah, I think I recently fed a call with uh, one of the teams behind the Sensui, and we discussed that potentially what we can see in the emerging space of Web3 is what actually fostered first innovation of Web2 when all different cloud infrastructure merged. And so I believe that uh, once we have this uh, totally interconnected cross-chain message passing and uh, actual value transferring, enabled in a way how cloud's working. I mean, uh, AWS cloud or Google clouds, et cetera, et cetera, enabling all those services like Facebook, et cetera. Then we can see the truly uprise in the uh, in the applications of uh, different projects that could go beyond financial services. And that's the second point I want to emphasize, is that I really believe that moving beyond financial services is the key to somehow, uh, let's say, trans transfer the attention of the user from just like borrowing, from uh, trading, uh, going ups and downs to the market, et cetera, et cetera, but into making more inclusive environment, especially for those unbanked uh, societies and populations in emerging countries like Africa and a few more, because I, I believe you're probably aware that over two, 2 billion of people and we have a bank account because they don't have ID, uh, no passport, no, no something else. In Latin America, people, for many reasons, there is an um, economist, his name is Leonardo de Soto, he has a book about this, uh, it, it's called The Quest of Capital. And the idea is that people can actually lend, people could have been lend their property or borrow against it or something, but they don't have the right structures in the proper way. And that's where so if the first approximation, it will be all about financial services still. But when we will see when all the, let's say, uh, content on the internet is structured in some way or another, like NFT, when we see rights, uh, digital identity, and cetera, still creating through different networks, seamlessly without being tied to a specific network, like EVM compatible or not EVM compatible, then I believe at, at, at least I expect that that's, this is what we could see during the next bull run, the uprise of such services. And we, together with all those who present from this um, alliance call, I would say we are somehow contributing to this, and uh, that's really inspiring. Uh, that, that's what keeps me uh, wake up every day, honestly. Yeah, I, I mean... Yeah, go ahead, Jason. Okay. Uh, sorry, Alex. Yeah, I agree with Nick, right? What gets me really excited about are these like real life use cases that's uh, coming into play. You know, one of the conversations I had just a few days ago was with uh, Checkout.com and how our Axler's uh, cross-chain infrastructure can actually support their new crypto payment processing uh, product, right? If you think about, you know, things like crypto payment processing, one of the major barriers up to today is people like might only have a certain asset on one chain and they might not have like gas to pay for it on chain. But when you have like an interoperability solution, you layer on some gas services that allow people to only pay gas at the source chain, or you can like have people pre-fund gas receivers so they can like not have to pay any gas. Now you can have a really seamless like crypto payment processing product where a user can check out not with just like USDC on one chain, but really like any token on any chain. And they might not even have to pay gas, right? And that is super exciting and really will open up the possibilities um, for various kind of e-commerce marketplaces that would be interested in having this kind of product. Yeah, I was just going to say that, like, I, I wanted to suggest a thing together, like, how powerful the cross-chain infrastructure can be and, like, what layers or what participants of the web-free economy uh, will be influenced by the decentralized interoperability layers. Because, like, from the protocol perspective, I think the uh, best advantage of having the decentralized interoperability that all protocols become globally accessible. Because before we saw that, like, smart contracts 
and uh, projects had to fork themselves and deploy across different chains just in order to tap into user base of other blockchain ecosystems. Uh, but having truly decentralized and secure interoperability layer, the protocol can become globally accessible. I can have like the smart contract to deploy on chain, let's say Polygon, and then users and protocols from all other chains can easily interact with my protocol in Polygon. And that also impacts users a lot, especially in terms of user experience, because I really think that in the near future, like the users will not need to switch wallets, switch networks. I can use a phantom wallet and I used to, I'm used to be like a Solana user, right? But I still, from my personal like phantom wallet, I can still interact with any protocol in Polygon or any protocol in Arbitrum without the need to switch between Phantom and MetaMask. I just send a transaction to the smart contract of the uh, bridge or interoperability layer in Solana, and then my transaction gets automatically executed by infrastructure in Polygon. And uh, yeah, because like in Web2 world, whenever we use the Web application, we don't need to switch hosting providers, right? And we never think about like whether it's Amazon Web Services or Hasner. We just use internet or web applications. And that's some kind of user experience that we will see in the very near future and about three as well, because users will not need to know about bridges at all. Bridges, users will just interact with the DAP they want to interact with from any wallet or from any chain where they have gas token. Um, yeah, yeah, so, so the, that's a bit from my side. Well, I would say like, Alex, you don't have to wait very long in 20 days, we're going to launch that for you, at least at Sushi. So all the Sushi products across all the chains that we support on cross-chain will be accessible from each other's chain. So you just select the chain and the token and the operation, and that's it. You hit one click and, you know, it does the bridging, swapping, zapping, underlying everything for you on that chain. And yeah, uh, but yeah on the contrary, uh, as a developer of, you know, like things that you guys make, there's sometimes also a UX lag when it comes to building application natively cross-chain. So a lot of application also relies upon momentary spontaneous. So there can be some things that you actually can't do in a cross-chain fashion because that involves some amount of delay, right? So given an example of Polygon, generally, uh, you know, like you have to wait like 50, 100 blocks for that. Uh, so there might be some operations on the other chain that you can't do it. So I still feel there are some limitations that cross-chain would go. It's not like, you know, like a silver bullet of just deploying like sushi on one chain and accessing liquidity globally. Uh, and there are, if, if that actually happens, that also, you know, breaks some of the mechanism, let's say on liquidations, right? If you have to like flash for this liquidations, you couldn't do it because cross-chain swaps kind of applications or, you know, messaging, it's not instant. It's just like traveling from, you know, a different country involves cost and time. It's not like, you know, you can easily arbitrage, let's say something like gold from different countries uh, because you can travel. It does involve some kind of, you know, delay and cost that also users and the DAP developers have to take care of. And I hope that Sushi will be really good trendsetter and will be showing a good example for all other protocols on how the DAP can become globally accessible. And uh, hopefully all other protocols will, will reach out to all of us and start using the interoperability layers that we, that we all are building. Absolutely. Oh yeah, well that, that is definitely gonna be us for sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. You know, we're, like I said, you know, we're, we're, we're very happy to um, kind of leverage all of the, the amazing updates that you guys are bringing to the industry with regards to interoperability. Um, I mean, we're just really focused on, on making it easy for users to interact with what you guys are building. Yeah, um, so yeah. it's very, very exciting. Yeah. So if I can add, Colin, I think the, I think you brought up an interesting question about seeing, you know, are there, you know, use cases or I should say communities or users coming over to the Web3 space? You know, we're seeing this um, uh, uh, firsthand with brands that you would recognize with social media companies, um, whether they're based in Asia. But more interestingly, we've, we've been seeing um, game companies that would you recognize from uh, playing on Play, PlayStation or your Nintendo Switch, uh, where... These, some of these game companies with over 100 million in annual revenue that are already exploring, how do they get into the NFT space, things like that? 
And it's interesting because they they come to come with this affinity towards a specific geographic region of the world. So <clears throat> if it's like Asia, you know, there's a specific uh, number of chains that they're already sort of very interested in, so on and so forth. But quickly, once they sort of establish how this thing works or, you know, down, if they're further down the line in the development, they're already looking at right, and understanding the, the sort of the multi-chain ambition, right? So how do they go from point A to B? How do we transfer their NFT so we, there's a utility there? So it's, uh, it's interesting to see the transition, and, and I think you will see more of this uh, news coming forward. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I've been a big proponent that um, games are really going to drive adoption of Web3. Mm -hmm. um, you, you saw gaming drive adoption in Web2 with social media. Um, I've said before, you know, I knew people who would have never uh, signed up for Facebook, but they were brought into it because of Farmville, right? right? So like they're, gaming is very powerful. Working towards tangible goals is, is a very powerful tool, especially when you wrap it up in a, in a neat package that kind of gets that dopamine hit for people. Yes, I um, it's, it's not too dissimilar from, from gambling, gaming. Um, so I, I do see gaming companies playing a huge role um, and, and with the adoption of NFTs for microtransactions and in-game items and, and in-game currency and things like that, having a, a huge network effect on, on drawing new people into the industry. Mm. Um, now, you know, talking about, um, you know, cross-chain and, and, and integrating it into decentralized applications, what are the pros and cons that you guys see in your development in this regard? Um, you know, what could you give us some insight on the pros and cons? I can go first. You know, one of the things we're really excited about here is, you know, um, the next generation of like cross chain wallets being like a super app similar to like a WeChat or Revolut experience where you can have integrate a lot of these cross chain applications and functionality right within the wallet. So then even a non crypto native user, like, you know, your mom or grandma, they can just download this wallet from the app store and without having to like, you know, know any other websites or know any other applications can just trust that right within the wallet, you can, you know, swap from any token to anything, take out a loan on one chain and, you know, do all of those like DeFi application that you're only used to doing today on single chain, but right within the wallet. And as a user, you never actually even have to leave the wallet and it can access the benefits of all of Web3 right in one place. Yeah, I think I think wallets and having cross chain functionality natively integrated into it is absolutely going to be key for mass adoption. Um, you know, I've said before, people don't really need to know how something works. They just need to know how to use it. Um, so making it accessible for for grandma or somebody to to just download it really easily off of their smartphone and and really jump into this new Web3 environment is um, is going to be absolutely key. Um, anyone else would like to weigh in? Uh, Steve? I would like to also say that uh, the thing with wallet is actually important because I believe that uh, everybody see that wallets, like digital wallets, becomes a uh, sort of ultimate digital identity person. And with uh, like it replaces credit history, history of your interaction with different DeFi protocols, etc. etc. And it's it's really it's really let's say unifying and uh, like like SMS technology or like email technology instead of being tied to specific uh, specific IDs, like Apple, everybody has Apple ID or either, I don't know, Google ID or whatever, instead of being like tied to the proprietary guys, uh, proprietary companies, you have a unified thing to access any service, at least in the future, because we're still in development mode for this. Uh, yeah, that's... Did are you are wrapped yes, up or would your mic cut out? There you go. Sorry, can you can you hear me? Yeah, your mic cut out for a minute. Could you repeat that? Yes, yes, yes. I, I was just saying that I believe that wallets is the crucial infrastructure for the adoption because it replaces uh proper three identities like Apple ID and some others, so it becomes a unified digital identity for users. Uh 
for the challenge because the question was also about challenges that we face while developing what we do. I would say that uh, in meiosis we see, let's say, um, we see so lot, lots of potentials like adding more networks simultaneously, like adding each network per week or something, especially even compatible because it's not the case. Uh, it's not technically like too hard for us to add and as many as we can. But uh, we need to set priorities here. Plus, given some emerging networks, we need to take care about security first. So I would say that we are pretty cautious. So the challenge is that we are being pretty cautious because uh, bridges and uh, solutions like ours, like in the chain, best, general passing data protocols, uh, deck that and so on and so forth, being hacked every single week. And so we're trying just to be as cautious as we can, potentially. And I believe the rest, uh, the rest here in the in our room chat today is also trying to be as cautious as as potentially we can. Oh, uh, for us, <coughs> yeah, for us, the, the the challenge has been. I think everyone could probably agree that this entire space moves extremely fast. So. It's sort of like keeping up with uh, the needs of the ecosystem, right? And then I think first starting out with the fungible the ERC twenty, then the the seven twenty one NFT, and and as more uh, you know projects requested to go interchain native, you know, there's general message things like that to be interoperable. So I think the challenge is like you can't go to Amazon and just buy any book that explains how to do this. It's like you know you have some extremely smart people working in this space to make this work and. By the time you write an article about it, it's already late, right? By two visions or something like that. So our challenge as an interoperability player is that we want to be able to connect, enable every node to connect to another node, because whether it's going to be, you know, transferring assets, uh, fungible NFTs, or passing messages, uh, that's the goal that we have. And we started with uh, to to streamline these things, and then we we started with supporting EVM compatible chains first. And now that you know, as you know, other chains that are non EVM become growing, we want to be able to support that. So it's sort of like whether we learn another language to adapt to this uh, and to help scale, or to keep pace with it, and we, and and at the same time, spending a considerable amount of our time in doing the uh, research and development has been a, a a really fun thing to watch, to say the least. But yeah, it's uh, you never know what what the next six months or next year of the development will come. So. Yeah, that's our view as a as a bridge provider, so to speak. You're speaking about cons, if I may put a word here. Uh, because we bridge so many non-EVM chains, the standards of everything can be very different from, again, everything we got used to seeing uh, in the EVM ecosystem. Uh, starting from the way uh, tokens are minted, for example, they can, they can be minted outside smart contracts. They can be minted directly in the user's account, or they can be minted in assets, which are neither user accounts nor contracts. And uh, you also have you, you have to support all those variations and all those standards. And some of the chains they have uh, such peculiarities that other chains don't even think about. And also, it, it it's a challenge how to transfer this without violating the rules of the chains you're sending from. For example, there's a blockchain called Secret Network, uh, which has secret NFTs, if you heard about this. Um, it's a, it's, it's, um, not, not every person immediately understands why you would even want to have a secret NFT. Like, what's the use? How would you sell a secret NFT in a marketplace if nobody can see it? But like I told you, NFTs is not, is not just a tool for speculation. It's a tool for instant uh, securing something. For example, imagine a government starts issuing IDs or licenses or patents to its citizens, and everybody has access to this information. Everybody on the planet. Uh, probably it's not that secure as everybody would like it to be. So you know, on Secret Network, you can uh, mint NFTs that are only visible uh, to certain entities, like to the issuer and to the owner. And nobody else can, can view this asset without the permission of one of the two. And then the question is, because there is no such standard on other uh, chains, how do you even transfer this NFT without violating the secrecy? Or do you have to create the same setup on another chain and um, transfer to a specific contract that preserves this secrecy? 
well, th these are the, the challenges that we uh, meet on our way. Um, and I think it's also important to understand that the more uh, globalized this uh, thing becomes, the more standardized everything should become for uh, compatibility between protocols. And it, it doesn't matter in what language it's written in Rust and E++ on Solidity or even Move. There's a blockchain that is now emerging uh, and it will be written in Move. Uh, you still have to be compatible with everyone else if you want to uh, join this sort of worldwide trade of assets. So this, this is what I wanted to say. Yeah. Um, in, in my opinion, like, like while developing, I generally face like, you know, two kind of cons or difficulties because let's say to start with how the development is actually structured, right? Like since there hasn't been any uh, popular, you know, cross-chain native DApp integrations, uh, currently all the people are kind of experimenting on how we should try to do it. A, a popular model is, you know, uh, this master slave or the root or you know like the sub or the child model where you generally have like a contract maintaining a global state on one of these chains and rest of the uh, chains and contracts talk to that this comes with uh, additional uh, cost as well as uh, time when the user needs to interact with these dApps the other major problem that comes while you know you get this integrated in your dApp is the security aspect right uh, we cannot actually, as you know, like DeFi and app developers, we cannot just tie to one of the solutions. That is, uh, I would not say a very ideal way to do it because we have seen that some of the most assumed secure bridges have been hacked before, and then most of these bridges have uh, kind of you know upgradability in them. So you don't even know that, like, let's say if, if the current version is safe, will you be safe on Reliant? So I think like one more problem that what I've been seeing lately with a lot of cross-chain messaging and bridging app is like um, they are not opt-in and they are like basically like forced upgrade. Uh, and most of the time they do not even bring good improvements. Uh, and while they upgrade you, while they expose your entire app to cross-chain attacks, right? So you are like, and the, the thing is whenever you get like this cross-chain attack, it's just not, you know, sabotages one network, it sabotages everything that you build around it. Uh, and I'm, I'm even like sure like going forward like we would just have like half the number of bridges that we have right now because the security models that you have to choose uh, there are and you know like you have to be really strict because your entire future of your protocol depends upon it so you have to narrow it down very much which just leaves very few bridges that you can trust and aggregation is still not uh, you know like smooth enough for you to understand which way to go because you have to bring in advanced monitoring like take the Ronin example like they didn't even know the hack happened like you know after like three four days i guess uh so y the protocols have to be more uh, more more careful on monitoring and you know like oh, which way is going how the upgrade is happening what it could mean for us so you know there are like a lot of more things to consider while you kind of you know build cross chain or you know integrate it natively excellent you know Dima and Sarang, you you guys offer me a perfect segue into this next question here. Um, you know, do cross-chain dApps need to be united? You know, in, in, in your views, do there need to be um, agreed upon universal uh, protocols for, for everything? What are your views on that? And do you have any insights on some additional integrative solutions that you or others are working on right now? Uh, let's see, uh, DJ, would you like to weigh in? Or Dina? Oh, can you hear me? Can yeah, you there me? you go. Yeah, good. Um, in terms of the solution, I um, actually, I would like to explain a little bit about how any swap multi-chain and change of phantom bridge we are building. Uh, actually, we are building it on the the most low, uh, the, the lowest layer, uh, which is the Signature layer. So we, from our perspective, all the chains, uh, they have one thing in common, is that every public blockchain, uh, standard, uh, they use the, the asymmetric uh, signature algorithm uh, to sign the transaction. 
that's the reason we want to build the interoperability on this layer so that, you know, everything could be compatible with each other. Uh, if we want to connect uh, a non-EVM compatible chain, we don't need something on the logic layer, uh, like the smart contract, but we build it on the signature layer. And, you know, most of the public blockchains, they use uh, ECDSA or use ED25519 algorithm as their signature algorithm. So if we conquer these two uh, signature algorithms, then we can connect all of those different um, different public blockchains together. So this is what, what we have done. But I have already uh, seen some other very interesting solutions like the uh, ZK Sync, uh, ZK Rollup. Um, they use uh, a different way uh, and uh, trying to pass the messages, uh, encrypted messages on different chains so that they can achieve the, the interoperability. Uh, but, um, but in terms of the security, I think it will bring more risk if you build it on more large layer. For example, um, if we look at the past two years, most of the cases, uh, I mean, the hacking cases, um, they are just because the improper arrangement in a smart contract. We, we are, um, everybody in this community, uh, we are a crypto fan. We trust in code. And we basically, uh, we trust in math. So I think math is the only thing uh, that is unhackable. Uh, that's the reason we want to build it on on the encryption layer, on the signature layer, um, trying to make it safe. Thank you. Perfect. Speaking uh, about it, Dima, yep. go ahead. Yeah. Your question was about integrative solutions, right? And whether the apps should be united. Yes. So mm -hmm. I think that absolutely yes, because each... Uh, app or HD app specializing in its niche has achieved some uh, perfection in what it's doing and by adding the experience of another D app in their sphere there will be some synergy that will create something more than one plus one gives two right it will be something more than that and for that reason it makes a lot of sense for different dApps to integrate each other. And you are quite right that for, for that matter, it also makes sense to create some standards so that it's easy for anyone to integrate with anyone else. So that you can, for example, as a wallet, you can uh, simultaneously integrate multiple bridges, multiple DXs, um, because they're all compatible. And I think uh, eventually, um, I think one of the speakers already mentioned that that it's much easier for the users to use one tool that they're used to, like a wallet, for example, that you can um, take to any blockchain that you want to interact with. And actually, it's the case that uh, wallets are moving towards that. Even MetaMask, which is very popular in the EVM ecosystem, I recently learned talking with Algorand, that they're going to support Algorand, which is super, super different from EVM, from anything you know um, about EVM. I don't know if any of you guys um, are familiar with Algorand technology, but uh, they're really very different from what you're used to. Uh, like, for example, they have uh, limitations of memory in smart contracts, limitations of memory uh, per single user. If you have an asset, you have to stake tokens to, to keep it and so on. And uh, for bridging, it's super. Uh, it actually creates a separate uh, vector of attack, because if your smart contract has limited memory, well, what you can do is you can send so many uh, transactions that you fill this memory, and then your contract gets stuck. So you have to change the entire logic that you are used to having on all the other chains where memory is uh, virtually infinite, and you have to then change everything so that you don't allow the attacker uh, this vector of attack. But still, you can make it co compatible with everything else, and that's exactly what we're doing as a bridge. So we still make it possible to uh, send NFTs to and from Algorand in a secure way, even though 
they have those limitations. Still, they are a fast and cheap blockchain, and uh, they're very attractive for some projects that we're currently working with. So um, I completely agree that uh, inter interoperability is the future for all of us. In, uh, as far as I understand, at the beginning, most of the blockchains were scared of losing their users um, if there were many bridges and they could go to another chain. But eventually, uh, the biggest blockchains realized that it's not a threat, it's an opportunity. Imagine uh, all the countries uh, kept their economies only internal. Nobody would trade, right? Whatever you produce, you consume. But what if you produce more than you can consume, right? Or what if you want to use some goods from another country? The same thing happens in the blockchain. It's not, you know, some separate world. It's still something that people do. And on, on one blockchain, they can make something that you want to have on your blockchain, but because there is no bridge, there's no way to bring it, um, and it's a problem. So totally integration, even uh, for blockchains that use different protocols, is the future. Excellent. Thank you, Dima. Yeah, that's a fantastic analogy. Um, if you don't mind, I will I will steal that from you and I'll, I'll definitely credit you uh, when I use that in the future when talking to our community. <laughs> if you read a little uh, bit of our, if, if you read our documentation, you'll find more like this. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> um, so uh, this is a more pointed question. Um, I'm going to field this to Sarang first and then if you guys want, you Absolutely, feel free to jump in. Um, now, building cross-chain DEXs, why has it not been that popular among the leading players? I know SushiSwap is just now uh, getting into this. Can you give us some insight as to you know any, any uh, difficulties from a development perspective, or has it just been a similar trepidation um, that Dima was just mentioning with, with cross-chain? Yeah, I mean, like... Uh, first of all, we actually need to define like what do we mean by cross-chain uh, DEX. So do we mean like a, a DEX which just has like, you know, liquidity on a single chain where all the rest chains could access it? Or do you basically mean DEX deployed on the, these different chains and you could basically, you know, like swap, bridge and swap? Uh, so the later part is something uh, which is like, you know, very much possible and, you know, uh, Sushi has done that and, you know, you can access that sushi.com slash swap. And you could you could do it right now, but when we talk about but this still has a problem where you know that the liquidity is fragmented and uh, the the experience is let's say a bit uh, a notch lower than what you could have with like a true native cross chain dex. But that still has a lot of problems and you know uh, game theoretical analysis to be solved before it's actually a reality. As I said before, cross chain messaging and bridges are not the silver bullet for solving the entire liquidity problem in DeFi, right? There are a lot of difficulties when you have to pair it with DEX because DEX are mostly uh, momentary, right? So by the time you go on the other chain, because it, it requires you to time, it requires certain amount of time. So like think think of like, you know, if you are getting like an iPhone cheaper in another country, but it's based on supply and demand. By the time you go and fly to that another country, probably the supply and demand might have changed and you might not at the same rate right so these are like you know few problems that you actually uh, kind of come to when you kind of create like you know a cross chain native dex but there are ways to kind of you know uh, go around it but there are, there are other problems that chime in so let's say let's talk about a bit into how cross chain mev would look like right so in this case you are basically announcing that hey i'm going to do a swap and this is my amount so and that, that too the mev actually gets a delay uh, they could actually front run you and there could be a lot that could go through this. But, you know, somehow you still avoid that and there are ways to do it. So there are these smaller problems which basically kind of, you know, group together and make make it, you know, like not very easy for us to build it. We have internally uh, been running some of the POCs and recently we're trying, uh, we are in, in the process of doing an integration where it basically kind of does uh, a, you know, like a partial cross-chain swap like a partial true native cross chain swap where the protocol has just liquidity on one chain but the users will be swapping from another chain and they'll be using the liquidity on uh, you know like the different chain this sounds cool and fun right 
but there are some caveats where it takes much longer time uh, and you know like there is a, definitely a market for cost index but again even if you have like a true native cost index you would still need dexes on different chains because that would still need you know like these uh, other defi apps have to be composable in the same transactions uh, unfortunately there is like no cross chain uh, primitive right now that can be you know uh, cross chain and also have a uh, finality in the, in the same transaction that's that's yet for now not possible so that also limits the amount of things you can do with it uh, but still like it doesn't it's still a lot a uh, big ocean for the apps to build on top of this tech uh, but again like it, it's not not that easy for the problems i described why not everybody is just you know like launching a new uh, sushi cross chain dex which is native but we are moving towards that direction for sure and again like security is a big concern right like we do not want this uh, to kind of be built in a bridge that could get hacked in the future that has some things that could be exploited in future because now it just not affects one single chain it affects every chain and then it's, it's, it's a problem for everyone but the current the solution that sushi swap uses is basically a momentary risk even if the bridge gets hacked which is like a pretty low security consideration uh, you know like uh, assumption that the user has to take uh, rather than lping into a bridge and what i actually also see is uh, bridges is, bridges are going to get burned because <laughs> a lot of tokens that you use right now are upgradable and they would upgrade to a more cross chain based uh, you know kind of architecture where you can directly use cross chain messaging to bridge like those bridge, you know like that token from one chain to another so you would not need a lot of liquidity on these bridges so probably they are like less honey pot targets for the hackers uh, so yeah <laughs> Yeah, and just to as Sarang explained it really in a really brilliant way. And uh, I mentioned before that like having truly decentralized interoperability layer, any protocol may enable or may leverage global accessibility. And whenever I talk to developers, I always say, you guys don't need to deploy your protocol across all the chains. You should follow the application-centric approach. You just should pick the one chain that suits your needs in the best way in terms of transaction fees, security, scalability, throughput, and synchronous uh, compatibility. Because like in 95% cases, all the builders can pick just one chain and then become globally accessible. And another 5% relates to projects that build foundation layer foundational layer of DeFi. Those are projects or like protocols that require to have synchronous compatibility because like bridging protocols enable asynchronous compatibility, right? And that's sufficient in most cases. But there are many uh, like there are many protocols uh, such as DAXs, lending protocols, routers, and liquidity aggregators where synchronous compatibility is required because in some cases we want to receive price feed from Oracle and then liquidate position in the same block and the same transaction. And that's the main reason why DAXs cannot be cross-chain DAXs in a sense that like DAX is just deployed in one chain, like the state of the smart contract is stored in one chain, and then any smart contracts from other chains can interact with it because there is no way to interact like synchronously. And uh, yeah, I, I think we will see DAXs that are deployed like across different chains like Sushi, but still like for foundational layer of DeFi, there is no way to keep the state in a single chain. And I don't think that this problem will be solved um, in the near future. And that's not a problem at all. Again, like foundational layer will be deployed in every chain where it should be deployed. Um, can I also say something? Uh, I think yep. that all this industry is in its infancy. And right now, like you said, that game industry uh, catalyzes or pushes forward the technology. Um, right now, uh, what happens is it's like finance for the sake of finance in uh, the crypto world. But I think eventually, well, because DeFi is basically about uh, reducing uh, control from the governments, from uh, big global entities such as banks and corporations, and about instant uh, transfer of resources from one account to another, 
eventually real economy like factories like ports uh, maybe airlines and other industries they will eventually understand that uh, using DeFi is much faster easier and uh, cheaper than using traditional banks and then each one of them uh, like Alex just said will stick to one or another blockchain because they would think that this blockchain is quick, cheap, secure, convenient, friendly, cooperative, supportive, and so on, whatever the reason, whatever they like. Or maybe because the, the core team is located in the same country where their core business is located and they can just come and uh, discuss things. And eventually, those DEXs, they will be like the banking system, like the SWIFT that exists right now in the banking system. And then it will make a lot, a lot more sense to actually transfer assets from one blockchain to another uh, more than it happens right now. So this, this is what I vision will happen eventually. Excellent. Thank you for that insight. Um, now, I do, I do want to mention real quick to our audience um, something that, that uh, Steve had said earlier. Um, this industry moves very fast. Uh, everyone wears a lot of different hats, um, has a lot of different responsibilities within their project. And we're already starting to lose some of our panelists today uh, because they have meetings and they have things that they need to attend to. So um, we are going to do two more questions uh, and then we are going to wrap it up for today because I know you gentlemen are very busy. Again, thank you guys for your time today and your thoughts on cross chain um so i'm actually going to field a question here from our audience um what is your plans for the bear market uh if it takes you know another year or two for us to kind of pull out of this downtrend um are you guys going to just keep focusing on what you're working on um and and continually engaging with your community and building um are you guys taking your foot off the gas a little bit um, and, and and kind of coasting until things improve. What are your guys' strategies in case we do experience a prolonged downturn in the market? Kyle and I almost laugh when you ask that question because if you could see the eyes under my, I mean, the bags under my eyes, you will see that we're, we're, we're slammed, right? So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So for us, it's, it's been really interesting because uh, during the bull market, you know, we saw everybody and their mother wanting a bridge, right? For all kinds of tokens and coins that you've never heard of, right? And then like uh, when the bear market comes and, and then you quickly see who the real players are. And these players are the guys who are building a, a, a you know, for the long term. And they're quickly asking for not just simple, you know, token bridging, what we, the conversations that we often start with them. But it's a really complex use cases of the general messaging and going across chain. So we're pretty backed up. Um, I think in the earlier um, part of the, the chat, you know, I was mentioning about we're adding about three chains uh, on average on a monthly basis. And, you know, we're, we're in fact, you know, prioritizing Ruthly as much as we can to support these ecosystems because, I mean, as... Members of Seller Network, we're deeply invested into this system. I mean, our team members have been teaching uh, free Solidity classes since 2017 and things of that nature. So we want to see this ecosystem grow. So um, we still have a number of projects in the queue that are very seriously building, um, really heads down. And, and so that's sort of the, the, the observation that I'm able to see as a bridge provider. In fact, um, you know, using bridge as a as a sort of a analogy here is, if you look at you know the Golden Gate Bridge where we're right by here in our office, is that one end of the bridge, you know, there's a thriving community of uh, you know uh, the folks down in the south, and then the other end is another thriving community of ecosystem. Now, if you could kind of imagine that as you know different layers or or destinations, for example, Ethereum or Binance or Polygon, they're blossoming and there are so many of these um, uh, projects that are not really getting the limelight, limelight now because they're so young, but the use cases that they're bringing is, is really another step up or two from the ones that we saw last year. And um, so we're also further encouraged by this. So, uh, you know, we're excited to support them. And, and I think for the entire community, it will benefit from this uh, as more of these projects come into fruition. Excellent. Uh, any of you other gentlemen have any input on that? 
Yeah, sure. Well, I would support uh, my colleague's words. Uh, uh, even though we observe that the token rates are falling, uh, we see more and more demand for bridging, for moving collections between chains, and we help uh, migrate entire collections from one ecosystem to another uh, for various reasons, because one of, one of the systems was hacked, for example, and uh, users are moving somewhere away, and uh, another chain starts growing and gives even uh, grants to the new projects, and, and projects migrate to that chain because it's uh, very interesting, and they also finance their ecosystems to move their tokens there, and we take active part in, in that. And we also um, integrate more and more blockchains, and they seem to become more and more interested in uh, in bridges that allow to get assets from other ecosystems. And actually, it's, um, it's an opportunity. Uh, I think that people who uh, use this ecosystem as a way of uh, quickly building money uh, they maybe will lose some something but those who came here uh, for the long term uh, they will just use this um, time for building something better for polishing their skills in whatever the niche they're taking um, actually i once worked with a german company um, and they of uh, they never think about things that happen right now. They have a strategy for the nearest 100 years. I'm not exaggerating. And then in, in this, when, you, when your uh, scope of planning is that long, whatever happens right now, whatever the falls and downs, they're like waves in the sea. You don't really care about them because when you see the big picture, when you uh, look globally, you understand where you're going, why you're going, and what you have to do now to get there in 100 years. And then you don't really care whether it's bear market, bull market. It doesn't really matter. Just do well what you're doing. Do it so that people like what you're doing, that they can use it, that it's convenient, that it's cheap, that it's reliable, and you don't care about falls and downs, downs and falls. It, it, it's not really important. Just think long. Excellent insight. Thank you. Uh, DJ, is there anything you'd like to add or Sarang? I would say like, the yeah, I, oh, sorry, go ahead, DJ. Yeah, yeah. I 100% agree with that. I think the matter, uh, it's a bear market or bull market. Um, it's, it's just like a cycle. And uh, what we need to think is where, we sh where should we be at when the next the bull market is, is coming? And uh, what's the next plan for this market? So this is what we, we are thinking. And uh, we are trying to prepare ourselves and uh, trying to serve the market when it is up. So this is what I see. Yeah, what, what I think is like, you know, you won't be able to enjoy the bull without a beer, right? And so, uh, yeah, it's, it's like a good time for us to, you know, uh, look back, introspect and, you know, kind of think in more an experimental manner of, you know, uh, how we can make things uh, much better, actually move fast without actually having a lot of, uh, you know, baggage or breaking stuff. So I think like uh, this time is like kind of much more, you know, useful at the development space where we basically build the foundation for the next bull cycle to come. Excellent. Uh, wonderful insight from each of you. Thank you guys very much. You know, at Rubik, we have the same philosophy. Um, you know, regardless of what the market is doing right now, uh, we see it as an opportunity to continue building, to continue partnering with people, building what it is that we're building, and making it more accessible for businesses to jump into Web3 um, and for making it easy for for new users to interact with web3 um, so that they can just jump right in and not have to worry about um, what chain they need to have assets on and you know all all of the different intricacies right now that are limiting factors for mass adoption in the space um, we are hoping to to really you know provide a uh, a comprehensive package that's easy for businesses and for users to interact with web3 so that brings me to my last question um, I'd like to ask each of you, 
what your thoughts are on Rubik and, and what it is that we're building and, and how you see us as an important aspect of Web3 adoption. Uh, DJ, I'll start with you. Um, I think currently uh, Rubik, has, uh, I, uh, I personally have used the Rubik quite a lot. But sometimes when I try to convert, for, for example, the theorem on binary smart chain into, um, into USDT on Ethereum, uh, it says, you know, the, the rate is not that good. Because you, your algorithm is, is, you, is trying to swap from, uh, from Ethereum into uh, USDT on Binance Smart Chain instead of Ethereum. Um, so I think in that part, uh, I, I'm looking forward to the improvements so that I can use it more. Absolutely. And we always appreciate feedback like that. Uh, we, we do have a long road ahead of us to optimize our routing and our path options. Um, and we have more updates coming very soon for all of our users with regards to that. Uh, Steve. Right. Sure. I mean, this is a little bit subjective because I think people know that I'm a big fan of Rubik uh, because, uh, I mean, we have a working relationship here in full disclosure. And I mean, we, we, you know, we use our general message passing within Rubik's protocol on Ethereum, uh, Polygon, Avalanche, and, and a few others. And the implementation there is to basically maximize the trade amounts for swaps, right, uh, under UX. Um, so if there's anything, um, we want to be sort of be challenged as well um, uh, in terms of, I mean, because the DNA of our founders are basically coming from PhDs and, and academia. So. Um, we want to be kind of a push to the boundaries to see what else can be uh, achievable uh, from the sort of the tool sets that are not available yet. Um, at the same time, I, I like to always encourage protocols to come up with sort of their creative use cases. Um, so even if it's an NFT DeFi that, is, that I've talked to a number of each of them find a one way or another to make theirs a little bit more unique and tweak it. So uh, basically, um, a personality, so to speak, in, in how they use these tools uh, and how they express that, it, it would be interesting. And I think a way to, uh, for Rubik to differentiate uh, as others and more players come into the space. Thanks. Thank you, Steve. Uh, Sereng. Um, My internet just got off, so I'm not sure what the question is. Uh, yes, I was just uh, asking for your thoughts on Rubik and what it is that we're building and, and, and you know, how you see us um, affecting change within the industry. Oh, yeah. I actually have, you know, like kind of, you know, checked out your protocol and it was reading through the docs and it really, really looks very, very impressive. And uh, especially like what I would be much more curious to uh, kind of, you know, play around much more is like your SDK. Uh, because it has uh, kind of, you know, like a good coverage of different chains that I would love to try and see on what more I can actually play around with it. And I actually love Rubik Cube. Uh, so yeah, that's that's like an innate love for you guys. Absolutely. Well, if I see you at uh, any future conferences, I'll make sure to give you one of our custom Rubik Cubes. Ah, nice. Love that. Uh, and uh, wrapping up here, uh, Dima, if you could give us your thoughts. Uh, yeah, well, we also met um, some Rubik uh, team members on one of the conferences in Dubai. And uh, actually, it was Sven. And uh, we had a very lovely conversation uh, during the after party there. So I think Rubik team, they're like very nice guys. And I, I'm really impressed on how many blockchains and DEXs uh, you guys support. Um, there are multiple bridges that you also integrated. And I'm sure I actually see an empty spot on the bottom right corner. And I'm sure this is a spot for XP Network Bridge because this would allow you to uh, connect to so many non EVM chains and uh, bring NFTs to and from those because we are the only bridge to those chains at the moment. So I'm sure we have a very uh, nice perspective of cooperation. Absolutely. You know, we, uh, we, we have our um, NFT widget that enables people to purchase multiple NFTs in, in one go, very similar to like, um, you know, a current eShop 
Um, so absolutely, we'll 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 have we'll chat more uh, as we go into the weekend for right. sure. Yeah, and we have a JavaScript library that allows you to integrate our solution right into your wallet with, like, within one day probably. Plus testing a bit, so I guess we we, we got to go for that. Absolutely, absolutely. Well. Gentlemen, thank you all so very, very much for participating today, for for lending us your time. And to all of our listeners out there, we had, I think at max, around 1,600 listeners today. Uh, We still have over 1,100. So for everyone listening, uh, sincerely thank you for giving us your time today, uh, for being here. And um, if there are any last-minute uh alpha that any of you gentlemen would like to give to the people listening today um anything you guys are working on any any inside stuff uh you're more than welcome to do so right now well i'd like to thank you colin for a wonderful panel discussion um everybody uh guys who joined here the speakers thank you for being so wise and polite and uh respectful um, it was re- really a pleasure being here with you and uh, hope to meet you in, in some conferences um, in the near future and meet you in person. So thank you for this wonderful panel discussion. Thank you, guys. It was like lovely talking to you. And yep, thanks, Colin, for having us and the lovely audience for, you know, sticking around for such a long time. Excellent. Yeah, likewise, guys. I think it was a, a fun, fun event. And uh, if any of the projects need anything with bridging support, NFTs, fungibles, or general message passing, come check us out at Seller Network. We'd love to work with you guys. It's been a pleasure. Thanks. Excellent. Well, thank you again, everybody, so very much. Um, to those listening today, I'd like to remind you, uh, if you go over to Galaxy, uh, if you sign up for our Discord and our Twitter accounts, um, and give us a follow on both. You are eligible for an NFT reward today. Um, so again, thank you to all of you listening. Thank you to all of our panelist members: uh, DJ from Change Finance, Sarang from Sushi Swap, Steve from Seller, uh, Alex from DeBridge, Nick from Symbiosis, Jason from Axelar, and Dima from XP Network. Um, it was a pleasure having all of you guys. I, I, I hope this is not the last time I have you gentlemen on to uh, have a, a panel discussion like this. Uh, we're going to try to make this a monthly thing on our end. And I'd love to chat with you more in the future. And, and I do. I look forward to meeting you guys maybe at a future conference. Likewise. Thanks, everyone. Bye now. All right. Thank you, everybody, so much for tuning in. This has been a inaugural opening first episode of our cross-chain web three panel series Uh, i have been your host colin o'brien thank you all so very much for stopping by and as always stay happy stay healthy stay hydrated but most importantly stay cubic take care everyone